Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Hong Siu Ching Lecture. I'm Kong Yun Fong, a professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and co-director of its direct of the Center for Asia and Globalization. Before introducing our speaker, allow me to say a few words about the Hong Siu Ching Lecture Series. The Hong Siu Ching Lecture Series was funded by a generous gift from Mr. Te Liam Wee, former CEO and Group Managing Director, Sincere Watch. The speaker and, uh, is named in honor of Mr. Tay's late mother, Hong Siu Ching. We are deeply grateful to Mr. Tay for the gift, which has enabled us to attract many eminent scholars and practitioners to share their thoughts with the school and the NUS community and the Singapore community over the years. You may remember that last year, Jessica Chen West spoke on the domestic politics of uh, China's foreign policy. And in years past, we have also had Tom Friedman from the New York Times, Mari Pangastu, former Indonesian Minister of Trade and Minister of Tourism, uh, as well as uh, Duvari Subaro, former governor of the Reserve Bank of India, regaling us on the significant issues and challenges of our time. We are indeed lucky to have such a distinguished cast of speakers. And that leads naturally to our Hon Siu Ching lecturer today, Professor Todd Hall of the University of Oxford. Professor Hall uh, is also director of Oxford's China Center and a good friend and former colleague. He received his PhD from the University of Chicago in 2008 and has held postdoctoral fellowships at Princeton, Harvard, as well as visiting appointments at the Free University of Berlin, Tsinghua University, and the University of Tokyo. He speaks both Chinese and Japanese, a uh, reminiscent of a uh, you know, coterie of scholars like Ezra Vogel, who could do both languages. Professor Hall is one of the foremost analysts of the role of emotions in international politics. You get a flavor of how he approaches the issue from one of the titles of his articles. It's called The Politics of Emotion in International Relations. Who gets to feel what? Whose feelings matter? and the history problem in Sino-Japanese relations. His 2015 book, Emotional Diplomacy, Official Emotion on the International Stage, was a co-winner of the 2016 Best Book Award, Diplomatic Studies section of the International Studies Association. He has also written important articles on how Japan, the UK and Germany dealt with the Huawei 5G choices or dilemma uh, and on making sense of China's Belt and Road Initiative and the problems of World War I, thinking of the contemporary US-China relations in terms of the World War I analogy. Uh, so you can see he's a very accomplished scholar with a wide range of uh, interests. So it gives me great pleasure now to call upon Professor Todd Hall to deliver the Hong Siu Ching lecture on how to make sense of how scholars make sense of PRC foreign policy. Professor Hong. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, which I, which I do not deserve. But it's very much my pleasure to be here today. And so I'm going to start out with, with what this is, this is based upon a piece that I'm writing with Andrea Giselli um, at Fudan University. And the basic question, I always think that, that most good talks have a question. The basic question that I'm asking today is how do we make sense of the ways in which various scholars have made sense of China's foreign policy? And I say this as a puzzle because uh, sitting in my position as the director of the University of Oxford's China Center, I see a lot of people come through and give talks on Chinese foreign policy. And what I found is instead of seeing convergence, we're seeing divergence. Some of the talks will say that China's weak or China can't organize or this is disorganized or this is, this is all bureaucratic politics. Others say China has a strong you know, 
strong base for its foreign policy, that it has, you know, and you hear things too, you hear from the media, 100-year plans and long-term strategic planning. And you, there's a lot of contradictions in the stories that one ha hears about Chinese foreign policy. Some focus on Xi, some focus on nationalism. And so within all of this, and of course, some of you may be familiar with some of the works that have come out, ranging from ones that say, like Rush Doshi's book, The Long Game, that say that China has this long-term plan to unseat the United States, to, to Lee Jones's work on, on fractured China, and, and Jones and Hameri's work on fractured China, where they're arguing, actually, it's a very disaggregated, very fragmented system. And so, this is an attempt to try and make sense of what we're seeing in all these different approaches and why we're seeing it. And how do we make sense of this diversity within the, understa within the understandings of for Chinese foreign policy? Now, this may sound like an academic exercise, but it isn't an academic exercise because how you make sense of these things also has very clear implications for how you respond. If you're a policymaker, an analyst, even in working in business, how you respond to what you think the PR People's Republic of China is doing. Because if you think, for example, that the PRC is a mess of bureaucratic politics, you're gonna have a very different approach than if you think, for example, this is all top-down coordinated policy with a clear strategy that's for the long term. And so the way in which Andrea and I have sought to make sense of this then is we've, we've, we've posed two basic questions. And we think these are the two fundamental questions that makes, helps us order, makes, makes sense of this, the various diversity we're seeing in the literature, helps us order what we're seeing. And the first question is, is the PRC distinctive? Do you think that the People's Republic of China is something that's unique, something that has characteristics that are unlike anywhere else, that are not a, that you can't compare, that you can't apply previous models to? Or do you think it's something that is a state like any other state, and that you, if you can figure out the sort of what kind of case is the PRC, then you can use those logics, as we've used logics from elsewhere, to make sense of it. The second is, do you think the PRC is unified? And so this is the question of, do you think the PRC can be seen as a state actor that has a unified state front that works in ways where the actions are all directed in the central manner according to certain logics and strategies? Or do you think we have to disaggregate, that we have to look inside, that there's actually multiple reasons from within for why the PRC is doing what it's doing? And when you take these questions, and why these questions? Why these questions and not other questions? Well, I think these are two of the most basic questions one can have. Because on the first one, if you answer this first question in the positive, then, of course, you have to set aside whole sets of theories that would come from other settings. If you answer the second question in the positive, of course, then there's all sorts of areas that you won't need to look at. And this changes how, and how you approach it. But doing it in this manner then creates, and this is, this is something for those of you who study international relations are probably quite familiar with, the favorite two by two, um, creates this two by two. And in fact, it's not, it's not a clear two by two, but I think there's variations and degrees within it. And some scholars, of course, may sit closer to the center, others may sit farther out. But I, you get four squares, and you get the, in the top corner, if you think it's, Unitary and distinctive, you have what I'd call the exceptionalists. If you think that it's unitary but not distinctive, you have the universalists. Unitary, if you think it's not unitary but distinctive, you have the particularists. And if you think it's not unitary, not distinctive, you have the comparativists. And I'll go into each of these categories because I think this really sort of captures the various approaches we're seeing to making sense of Chinese foreign policy right now. So to begin with, the exceptionalists. These are those people, those scholars, who look at China, who look at the People's Republic of China, and say this is something that's not like anything else in history. Or this is something that, at the very least, is different than, for example, Western models of international relations or Western understandings of how politics work. These, and I think there's, there's two, you know, two major approaches within the exceptionalist school, if one could call it a school. The first, and this is Xi Jinping, I would call an exceptionalist. I think he's, he, he belongs to the school. This idea, the love for peace is in the DNA of the Chinese people, right? Here's this notion that there's something about 
Chinese culture, cynic civilization, something about the cynic experience and history that makes the PRC as the inheritor of that distinct from other countries. And this is not just, of course, you know, Xi Jinping, I, would, I mean, he does have a PhD from Tsinghua, but I wouldn't necessarily call him a scholar of international relations. Um, but you do see this among scholars. You see this among scholars within China. You see this also, also outside. The idea, for example, that, uh, that the notion of Tianxia, or the idea that the tributary system created a certain heritage that makes the PRC unique the, as the inheritor of that, that it sees international relations different. And because it sees international relations different, because it has a different history that it's drawing upon, or different values or such, that that will also mean that the PRC will behave differently. And you see, of course, again, this is something you see repeatedly in PRC official rhetoric. You see it in, in, a, in quite a few, what I'd say, quasi-official scholars in the PRC, but also those two who make these arguments about East Asian international relations is different because there is something about the values, Confucian values, Confucian heritage, for example, that makes the PRC somewhat something different. On the other hand, you also have another exceptionalist school. And this is an exceptionalist school that I think you see much more within the United States, possibly in parts of Europe. And this is the PRC as a techno-authoritarian power. And so if the one has this idea of a civilization power, the other has this idea of the PRC having mastered this formula for economic and technological development, surveillance and oppression. So this is, it's somehow the PRC has managed to do what other authoritarian or quasi-authoritarian countries couldn't do. It's managed to somehow get the people within the PRC to follow these well-calculated plan, you know, and you see this. You see this in the language of the 100-year plans, and the PRC can do what other countries can't. The PRC has the expertise. The PRC has the technological ability. The PRC, you know, has made that leap to something that we have never seen before in history, and therefore is able to execute a type of foreign policy, a type of industrial policy, a type of military strategy, et cetera, et cetera, with precision, with unity, that we don't see anywhere else, that, for example, you know, democratic countries like the United States or the UK or such would be unable to do. Now, if those are the exceptionalists, the universalists say, wait a second. Yes, maybe, you know, there's, there may be certain things that seem somewhat unique about the PRC, but the PRC is still in the international system. It still faces all the structures and pressures that any other country as a rising power, et cetera, would face within the international system. And those who are the universalists say, look, actually we can look at the past and we can look at other patterns of whether it be it rising powers, be it great powers, be it powers that you know, have the place within the, PRC, within the international system that the PRC does, and we can make sense of that. And of course, I'm sure many of you are familiar, you know, Graham Allison's work on the Thucydides trap. And he, Graham Allison, he, he goes and he says, OK, look, we have 16 instances of power tr transition in the historical system. Now, you could argue about that. You could quibble about you know, whether, they were, whether they were power transitions or not. But we, he says we have 16 instances of power transitions in the international system. Of those, 13 led to war. Because the pattern of power transitions is one in which you generally have a rising power. The rising power is in a situation where it's coming into a system where it didn't create the rules that it wanted, that it's an outsider. It wants to change that system. That usually leads to conflict with the power that's in, the, with, the, with the power that is the incumbent or the hegemon, and that will lead to conflict. And of course, the, the incumbent will worry about its position, and that makes it more likely now, Graham Allison, to be fair, he doesn't say that it will absolutely lead to war. He just says that the possibility of war is stronger or higher because of this trend, of this, this logic that plays out. And you can look at history, you can find these patterns, and these patterns will repeat. You see this too, for example, Mersheimer. Mersheimer, I would say, was a universalist. He says, look, PRC, the People's Republic of China, is no different than the United States. The United States, when it was a rising power, what did it try to do? It tried to dominate its region. It fought all sorts of wars. The United States' rise wasn't peaceful. I mean, it fought with Spain. You know, it fought, 
There, you, know, you, have, you have a series with Mexico, you have a series of wars. The United States had actually a pretty bloody rise, but that's what rising powers do. They seek to dominate their regions and then prevent any other powers ari arising that could challenge them in other regions. That's what the United States did when it was rising, and that's what the PRC will do. And so what's the PRC doing? Well, it's going to try and dominate its region. And once it's dominated its region, it's going to then try and interfere in other regions to prevent other rising powers from rising. And the United States, because it does not want any so-called peer competitors, will try and keep the PRC down, and therefore we're destined for conflict. And this is another, again, this is another universalist view. We can look at these, these logics, it's just replay throughout history. Now, the particulars say, actually, you know, you have to look inside. Because in the end, it's the leaders, it's the governments who make the policy, it's the domestic politics that determines the Chinese foreign policy, right? And if you really want to understand, you have to look at what's going on on the inside. And so, for example, you need to understand the system. You need to understand that there's, you know, the PRC system is put together in a very particular way, and there's those who have mapped this out. This is not a complete map, of course, but you know, you have the Standing Committee, you have the Politburo, you have what is now the, the Foreign Affairs Work Commission, which brings together all these different groups, and then, of course, you have the center, you know, you have this central party office, you have the state council with the foreign ministry underneath it, you have the, the military commission, that all these come together in certain ways. And the military commission does not sit under the government, it sits under the party. And so understanding how these things fit together is very important because that tells you how the political system works. And you need to understand how the political system works to understand how foreign policy is made. And so we need to go in, we need to look at how are decisions being made, who's making those decisions, what's the bureaucratic infighting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are those who even go further, if I can, there we go, and it's the leaders that matter. We need to actually look at the leaders. Xi Jinping is very different than Hu Jintao, who's very different than Jiang Zemin. And you look at, you know, and so we need to study Xi Jinping thought. We need to make sense of what does Xi Jinping really think. And what Xi Jinping thinks is what's going to be Chinese foreign policy. And that's what we have to understand. And of course, you can look at the leadership. And this is, of course, you know, David Lampton's made these arguments. Others have made these arguments. Leaders are really key to understanding Chinese foreign policy. And therefore, understanding that helps us understand what we're seeing on the international stage. Now, the particulars, what they do, of course, is some, in some cases, they just look at what's going on. In other cases, they make Chinese-specific, PRC-specific theories of international, of international relations. This is how the PRC behaves. This is how we can understand the PRC behaving under these circumstances. And the final group is the comparativists. And they say, look, we do have to look at the domestic politics. We do have to look at the leaders. We do have to look at all these things but they fit within more general theories. There, is a, there are logics. There are logics of authoritarian states. There are logics of post-communist um, or states that have the system, the, the quasi-Leninist system that the PRC has. And there, those logics do play out in certain ways. And we can look at other states and we can look across these and we can make sense of this. And, and so the internal politics matter, but they fit within larger political theories. And these are things like people who argue about authoritarian legitimacy, that authoritarians to stay in power, they need to do certain things to make sure they have a certain selectorate that keeps, that keeps them in power and supports them. And therefore, you see these bargains. And this is a logic that plays out not just within the PRC, but across many authoritarian states. And so there's certain types of logic that are, are similar. And you see this, for example, most recently, Susan Shirk's book, Overreach. I don't know if any of you've had the chance to look at it. It's a great book that looks at the internal workings, but also tries to put it in comparative perspective, saying that under the Hu Jintao regime, what you had was you had a system where it was weak in the center. And therefore, these various interests would trade off. They wouldn't fight each other, but they would trade different things. And this led to various groups pursuing their own interests. And that led to ever strengthening, how should I say, overreach on, on the international stage. And this is a logic that she takes from Jack Snyder's Myths of Empire. He was looking at 
um, Imperial Germany, he was looking at Imperial Japan. And it's a logic that played out under Hu Jintao because he had a weak center. So you'd have these various bargains. We let you do this, you let us do that. And therefore, we see these foreign policies going in all these different directions. She argues that since, of course, Hu Jintao has left the stage and been replaced with Xi Jinping, you have a different logic. Xi Jinping has concentrated power. Because he's concentrated power, people do not want to tell him things he does not want to hear. He's not getting the information he needs. This then also leads to overreach. So she has two different stories of why you see overreach, but both of them are dependent upon logics of authoritarian polities. So, again, this is not just academic. Why does it matter? Because, for example, let's say a crisis happens in the South China Sea. If a crisis happens in the South China Sea and you're a universalist, I mean, maybe you read it as, well, this is China in a Mersheimer sense. This is China, of course, seeking to expand its hegemony in the South China Sea. If you're a particularist, you may say, well, actually, we need to look at, you know, who's, what, what, what part of the bureaucracy was responsible for, for doing this. And it could just be that this was a captain who was acting out of turn. And we need to make sure that, you know, there's, there's ways in which let's see what Xi Jinping says about this. And let's see what Xinhua says about this, et cetera, et cetera. If you're an exceptionalist, you may say, no, this, this crisis is happening, but China's not going to behave like other powers behave, so we don't need to worry about these crisis dynamics. Again, these, the way in which you make sense of this does then reflect how you're going to see how the PRC behaves. So why do we have these differences? Well, I mean, of course, a very simple answer is, is that different actors bring different worldviews. Um, or to put it in sort of the jargon of, of the academy, different ontological priors. That if you think that the world's made up of great powers that are unitary actors that act rationally, you're going to see the world very differently than if you think that it's made up of individuals struggling in bureaucracies. I mean, I personally, I personally come from the University of Oxford and have worked in, worked in local government, and so I think my sympathies are very much for there's a lot of bureaucratic troops because that's the world I've seen. But then there's others who see and interpret the world differently. But there's also issues of language, you know, depending on the sources you have, you have um, access to and your interlocutors. Who, who are you engaging with? Who's telling you what stories? What sources are you using? Your methodologies, certain things, for example. It's, it's very hard to peel back and understand what the bureaucratic politics are sometimes if you're looking from the outside at just official documents or just looking at, for example, quantitative, certain quantitative sources. But I don't think that's the whole story. And I'll be honest with you, when I started out with this, and so when Andrea and I started writing this, my, my personal goal, I was, I, 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 if I were to have classified myself previously, I would have classified myself as a comparativist. I probably, that's probably where my sympathies lay. But having done this more and more and had many of these conversations, I realized actually that that's not completely right. Because even if, even if we take into account that different people have different worldviews and use different methodologies, actually there is some truth in many of these different approaches. There are certain things that are unique to China. There are certain things where the PRC is acting in a unified fashion. There are certain things that are very particular. And there are certain things where there are logics that, of course, the PRC shares with other countries. And so it's not simply a fact that one or the other view is correct. But in fact, we need to think about the, uh, where which applies. And how do we think about that? Well, for one, policy areas. Some policy areas, for example, it is much easier to have a unified policy than others. If you're engaging in information control, there's the, the directions from which it goes from the center down to the various units that are responsible for publicizing the PRC's views. Information control is a much narrower avenue than something like the Belt and Road Initiative, which is this massive, sprawling economic form of, form of economic statecraft. So the more actors you have involved, the more interests you have involved, the less likely it's going to be unified. But there are certain things where we could say, 
Well, in these areas, because the lines of control are such that they're very clear, where the focus is very, is very precise, then maybe they, the unified actor approach does work, and we can think of them in those ways. And maybe, because of the way the PRC system is put together, there are certain things that are relatively unique. I mean, again, there's the, the way in which you have, for example, a military that doesn't sit under the civilian side, but sits under a central military commission. And so there's various attributes of the system that do mean that those unique, except somewhat quasi-exceptionalist views may, may actually apply. But there is also another way to think about policy area. And I had the opportunity to speak to somebody who spent some time unwittingly and unwillingly in the custody of the Chinese security services. And, and he said something very interesting to me. He said, look, usually when you go over to the PRC as an academic, you interact with a group of people who more or less are international. If you go to conferences, you're interacting with scholars, et cetera. You end up in the state security services custody. You interact with a slightly different group of people. These are people who don't have a lot of international contacts, who live in a very different world, who have a very different worldview that's very much shaped by the system that they're in. And so, in fact, the notion of different understandings of how the world work may actually pertain differently to different parts of the system. The economists who are involved in running the PRC economy, who, some of whom who, I mean, some of the previous ones who were trained at international institutions, who have done their time at Harvard, et cetera, are very international. They may be the, that type of foreign policy that they would generate may be very different than the type of policy that would be much more insular, much more based on, 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 on a view that has been, how should I say, cultivated within the system of certain elements of the security services, for example. And so there are maybe, different, depending on the different elements of the system, the values, the understandings, et cetera, may be different. But we also need to think about how values, historical analogies, historical understandings get transmitted without assuming that that's natural as well. The other thing I'd say is thinking about time. It may be that certain understandings did work at different times. Again, these are all very different types of leadership. The Mao era, and it wasn't just Mao, it was, an, the, you know, it was the entire way in which the PRC functioned during that era, is very different than how it functioned under Hu Jintao, which again is becoming very different than how it's functioning under Xi Jinping. So certain understandings of what is unique or distinctive and certain understandings of what is shared or, I mean, excuse me, in certain understandings of how centralized it is. It may be that the system now is becoming much more centralized than it was before. And so the theories that we had of, of authoritarian fragmentation, for example, may, we may need to revise those somewhat. The other part, time part two, is it depends also on when we're looking at things. I mean, it's very interesting. The BRI comes out. Xi Jinping gives all the speeches in 2013. You have a year or two, then the policy documents come out. And then you have the analysis of the policy documents. The people looking at the policy documents say, oh, the PRC has this very well thought out strategy of building all these routes and infrastructure and all these things to, to build its economy, to exert control, to deepen its international influence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then the implementation comes. And the implementation, and of course this is, this, is, this is one article by Jonathan Hillman, there's all sorts of other books I mean, and articles out there that say similar things, is that you know the Belt and Road has yet to materialize its promise. The six economic corridors, you look at it, you know, much of the BRI activity didn't happen in the corridors, didn't happen in the way that the policy documents anticipated, happened in places that had very little to do with the original BRI documents, et cetera, et cetera. And so the implementation then was much more fragmented. And that's in some ways what you might expect, because of course, organizing a big system is very different than articulating policy. But then again, what we're getting into now is after that initial rush, that campaign, that massive BRI push, we're getting learning. And there is refinement. 
And with the refinement, now the policies are changing again. And so depending on where you look at it in this policy, it may be that unified versus, versus dis, non dis, how should I say, disaggregated view works better. But, and coming to, coming, I, I, coming to the end, I hope I'm doing well with time here, um, coming to the end, more or less here, the biggest hurdle we face, though, still, is opacity. So I was in, I was in Beijing a few weeks ago, and one of, my, one of the things I would do is I'd ask the people I met, well, can you explain to me how it is that we got this sudden change in COVID policy? And for every person I asked, I got a different story. And many of those stories could be simultaneous re simultaneously correct. And the truth is, is we don't know, as far as I know. We don't know why, who made this decision, why, for what reasons. I mean, I've heard everything from, well, Xi Jinping caught COVID and then he realized it wasn't that bad. And so he said, okay, let's get rid of the policy. To, to the issues of provincial officials not being able to enforce the policies anymore and revolt from the bottom to all these different. The thing is, is we don't know. And the opacity in the system actually makes it very possible to tell a whole bunch of different stories that all seem like they could be correct. And so what do we do? I mean, the problem is, of course, is as scholars, often our scholarship comes years after the fact and we figure things out only years after the fact. But going forward, I think we do need to keep an open mind to these different ways of approaching it. And first of all, when we're approaching these problems, we need to ask, what are the observable implications? And so not just does this story fit with the facts that we have, if this story is correct, what else should we expect and where can we see it? And that's what we always need to keep testing ourselves on. What other things should have happened or what other things shouldn't have happened and when should they or should they have not happened? And that's what we need to keep asking. We also need to think about probability and plausibility because you may tell a good story about how we get from A to B, but if this story, for example, involves something that sounds like a massive conspiracy theory of keeping hundreds of thousands of people quiet, and all doing exactly the same thing as the leadership wants them, that's probably less plausible than something that may have been just a bureaucratic mess up. And there I'm thinking of things like, you know, is the, is the balloon that flew over the United States, was that a conspiracy to derail the meetings with the US and China, or is that just uh, something that happened that was not an intended effect of a experimental program? But, Last, I think, Stu, is, is we do need to keep humility. And so I'm very suspicious of people who say they know exactly what Xi Jinping thinks, they know exactly what the reason for this policy is, they know exactly why this happened. I think we do need to keep humility and need to, to be honest when it is possible that there are multiple explanations and we don't exactly know what the answer is. And that's what I say as a scholar. Uh, that's not always, that's, how should I say, and I know that's very difficult at some point, at some times for those in the policy world who need some of that certainty to make decisions, but that's the world we live in. And so, with that, I will thank you. Thank you for your time and attention.